Joe and Big Al spitball on investing in index funds, bonds, CDs, treasuries, annuities, net unrealized appreciation on company stock, and where to park cash right now. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 460. Plus, how do taxes, Roth conversions, or the mega backdoor Roth, and donor advised funds factor into those investing strategies? Will and Debbie in Gettysburg are investing an inheritance. LJ and Philly and Jane want the fellas' take on the pros and cons of various safe investments. Roger and Jessica in Cowtown, Fort Worth, need four different financial spitballs. And should ME in Atlanta do a Roth conversion and put money in a donor advised fund in the same year? But first, Diana in Spotsylvania needs an investing plan for her 86-year-old mom. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA. All right, we got Diana from Spotsylvania. <laughs> Spotsylvania pronounced like Pennsylvania. Oh, Spotsylvania. All right, Virginia. I love your show and listen to on the drive to work. All right, I've learned so much from you. And you make learning about finances interesting and fun. Well, thank you very much, Diana. I'm requesting some spitballing today for my 86-year-old mother. Her net worth is about 950000 which includes 230000 in a traditional IRA. And most of the remainder is in a brokerage account. Her annual income includes a survivor pension, stock dividend, Social Security, which totals about fifty grand, more than enough to cover her expenses. Prior to my father's passing last year, he was actively trading stocks. Just before he passed, he sold many of the more volatile stocks because mom and I are not knowledgeable enough to continue this individual stock trading. Currently, in the brokerage account, she holds some long-term stocks for the dividends and some CDs with buried maturity dates. The CDs are recent purchases just to earn some interest until we decide how to proceed with the investing. My mom would like to grow her worth for children and grandchildren. So my questions are, number one, how aggressive should we be with investing in her situation since she's set for the remainder of her life? Can we throw all of the cash into growth-type index funds? Or is this... Or is a diversified portfolio still important in this situation? Number two, should she be doing Roth conversions to try to lessen the tax burden for the heirs? She has never had a Roth IRA. Can she have one? Follow-up question. If she does a Roth conversion, what happens if she passes away before the five-year rule? All right. Okay. Very good, Diana. Got a lot here. Yeah. So she's got some cash. She doesn't need the cash. The money's going to go to the kids and the grandkids. So how should she invest? I would do a globally diversified portfolio still. And here's why. Because at 86, you never know, right? Is she going to have to go into a retirement home or assisted living or something like that's a lot more expensive? She could have another 10, 15 years of life. She could. So I wouldn't be thinking about the kids and grandkids just yet. So I would stick with what works for her and her goals. Yeah. I mean, I think that's well said. But if she's got enough fixed income that you believe is going to cover any necessity through the next several years, and if there's a, an event that is going to require cash, you know, is there other cash that you can, you know, because let's say she, Diana says, all right, well, should I invest this for myself and my kids? Well, y you could and have it in more of a growth type portfolio, but I still want to be diversified. I would be in low cost index funds that's diversified, not like Tesla stock. Well, I would just say, so my mom at age 89, her rent tripled when she moved into a retirement home. That's what I'm you know, you got, fresh you, in my you mind. Got facts. I, that's very fresh, right? And it's just like, I wouldn't necessarily assume that uh, your mom is set for life. She may be, but let's have a little bit of safety here in case she needs to access it. All right. I don't have that experience. So we'll just go with you, bud. <laughs> okay. All right. Roth IRA, should she do some conversions? Well, let's see. So her income's around 50 grand, right? It's going to blow up the Social Security tax. It, it is. And plus, I wouldn't do any more than the 12% bracket anyway, which is going to be just a small amount. And probably Social Security income is going to be more of a tax than it was. So it's not going to be a 12% rate. So I would say no on that one. Because the RMD is not that big. It's $8,000. Maybe it's going to go up a little bit. But if if she's invested conservatively, it's probably going to stay at that eight ten thousand. 10000 It's probably going to decline versus going up depending on how it's invested. 
Um, the, the other thing here, too, is if she does need it for some kind of retirement facility. It's going to have a tax deduction. Yeah, have a tax deduction for the medical part, right? And so it, it's just fine to have some. If she does the conversion on the other side of me and says, yeah, if I'm investing this for Diana and her grandkids, I absolutely want to convert the whole damn thing and put it into growth stocks and have it grow one, you know, tax-free for the heirs. Yes, I, I agree with that comment. So if that's your strategy and plan, then yes, I would convert the IRA into a Roth IRA and I would have it more of an aggressive diversified portfolio in the Roth that I would name the grandchildren the beneficiary of it. Yeah, and I agree with your comment. I'm just suggesting I, I don't think that's the best plan. Sure, I mean, because you never know what's going to happen, right? Right. The five-year clock, yeah, the five-year clock still happens at death. So she converts, God forbid she dies the next year. There still has to be five-year within that conversion because she's never had a Roth before. Correct. So the heirs would have to wait four years for the tax redistribution on that earnings. Yep. Agree with that. Okay. Got Will and Debbie. They write in from Gettysburg, PA. Gettysburg. It's a great they, town. Yeah. They had a little war there. <laughs> they did they way back when. They had a little scuffle. That was an important one. It was. Uh, Joe, Al, Andy, I'm a little confused to what to do with an inheritance. Uh, inheritance I just received. Uh, where and how should I invest it? My dad recently passed away and I received $200,000 from the sale of his home. I also received about 1,800 shares of stock that my mom used to work at. Uh, so there's some sentimental attachment. I would like to leave some for my children to inherit. It is currently valued at $115, 115 bucks a share. Right. I also received $50,000 in cash and bought some CDs with that money. There was also some money from an IRA that I'm taking about $3,000 a year to use for vacations. My wife is on SSDI and collects $2,300 a month and $4,000 a month from a structured settlement, which she will collect for life. But if she predeceases me, I will only collect it until I turn 70. Am I wrong for thinking that this structured settlement is like having $1 million saved? $4,000 a month. 48,000 a year, call it 50,000 a year. Look at a million bucks, 5%. I, I see where you get that, I, but I would say no. <laughs> First of all, you don't have access to it like you would a million dollars if you need it, number one. Number two, the 4,000 a month is probably a fixed number. If you had a million dollars, presumably you take 4%, but it's growing at six. So it's a growing balance. Uh, and number three is it could stop if your wife predeceases you. So no, it's not quite the same, but I get the comparison. Okay. My wife and I have about $423,000 in a 401k IRA. We have $100,000 in a CD separate from the inheritance money. We will receive $1,900 a month from a sale of a property for the next 26 years. I'm going to receive a pension of six fifty dollars a month at 65. My wife will receive a pension of nine hundred dollars at 65. A lot of numbers getting thrown out here. Hopefully you're keeping up. I got a couple of things jotted down. All right. I don't plan on withdrawing any money from retirement accounts until I'm about 72. Our main home in Gettysburg is about 400000 is paid for, as is a condo in Florida. I make about $45,000 a year, and I'm thinking of retiring after I turn 55. I know I have to pay for insurance, but I'm hopeful ACA credits will help. Is this feasible? Am I in good shape? Where to put that inheritance money? I think we spend about $65,000 a year, but I'll have to spend more time analyzing this. I'm 54. My wife's 57. I drive a Ford F-150. And my wife, a little Jeep Grand Cherokee. Got it. We have a German Shepherd that loves to hang out the window. I love to kick back with a little rum and Coke. Oh, tasty. Well, let me give you a couple numbers here, Joe. All right. So, well, first of all, I guess they're inheriting about 450000 by doing the math, plus an inherited IRA, which they didn't tell us what it's worth. So let's call it 500000 inheriting. Okay. And they've got about a million liquid, including the inherited money, because of 500000 otherwise. So let's say they've got a million liquid. Wife's got income of about 76000 a year between SSDI and her monthly structured settlement. Right. And they're spending, let's see, what 65, are they? 65. 000. So she makes 76. They're spending 65. So 
check plus they got a million dollars that they're not even currently using so yeah and that's even not even including uh, his pension he's going to receive later and we don't even know about social security do we no yeah so yeah this seems like it's fine so we'll, we'll start there it seems very feasible well, what i would take a look at <clears throat> is that so Debbie's on some sort of disability. She's got a structured settlement. Something probably happened there. And if she did predeceases will, that's where things get dicey, right? Because a lot of the income that's coming in is from the structured settlement in the SSDI. Yeah, so that's, that's 50 grand. However- Well, it's more than that. It's the whole fixed income source is coming from Debbie. Oh, well, that's true. S- so the she, SSDI would right. go away too, yeah. So if she yeah. predeceases then- You're right, you're right. Will is going to live off of the liquid assets. So I would want, and they're young, 57, 56 years old, and this money's going to last quite some time. So if you want to spend $65,000 in a million bucks, you got to bridge a gap. If something happened to Debbie, if sure. Debbie lives a normal life expectancy, I think they are in really good shape. The caveat is, is that planning, everything doesn't come out roses. So you have to plan for some you know, unexpected life events. Yeah. And so I would want to make sure that they're managing that liquid assets appropriately to make sure that there's going to be enough to provide if Will or if Debbie, something happens to either one of them. Yeah. But more importantly, I think if something happens to Debbie, I mean, that $7,000 is a month is gone. Yeah, it is gone. And so there's, I'm sure there's social security, so that'll help. I guess Will has a pension of 650 so that's you know what seven eight thousand a year or something like that so that, that's at least something plus they've got a they've got two properties free and clear so could sell one of the properties if need be and generate another three four hundred thousand dollars so that that could add to the total so I think there's ways to make this work but I agree with you so so if Debbie lives a good long life expectancy this looks great if she dies prematurely then Will may have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, I've, I've got assets. I can make this work, but I'm going to have to maneuver stuff a little bit. Yep. Now, next question, where should they invest the inherited money? Well, I think they have to invest all of the money collectively to the retirement. It's not collecting, hey, I have 200000 Should I invest this different? It's funny how people look at money. Yeah. Is All right, well, here, I, inv- I inherited a retirement account that was already in stock mutual funds. So I'm going to invest that in stock mutual funds. Oh, I inherited another 200,000 from the sale of the home. So I want to put that in cash. Well, no, you just want to make sure that it's a globally diversified portfolio based on what your goals are. And it sounds like the goal is retirement, that this money needs to last over the next 25, 30 years because they want to retire in their mid fifties. Right. Yeah. So that's exactly right. So let's, if they've got a million dollars to work with roughly, then you got to look at what your total goals are and invest appropriately on the whole amount, not look at this in compartments, which I think is exactly what you're saying. And and, and I agree with that. And then let's see, will they, they will have to pay more health insurance, the ACA credits. Will that help? Probably. I mean, SSDI is non-taxable. I'm the structured settlement. I'm assuming it's non-taxable, but I don't know that for sure. If those two are non-taxable, their income is probably low enough to be able to qualify for the ACA credits. All right, Will, Debbie, hopefully that helps. Retiring richer requires investing smarter. Discover how to choose the best asset classes for your goals, how to optimize your asset allocation and capital gains, and how to manage your emotions and risk for higher returns in your portfolio. Whether you're new to investing or want to sharpen your skills, our two investing guides will help you make the most of your money. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, go to the show notes, and download 10 Steps to Improve Investing Success and the Investing Basics Guide for free. During the holiday season, YMYW is the free gift that keeps on giving, so don't forget to share the show and the financial resources with your friends. Uh, we got LJ from Philly. He goes, hey, guys, last time I had a question about capital gains from the sale of a rental that Big Al answered. Thanks. Now I'm looking about $500,000 in cash that I plan to use on a primary home in a few years. With short term, I'm looking to maybe ladder some CDs. Rates are pretty good right now. Yeah, 4 or 5%. Yeah. So he goes, do I have this right? The interest on CDs will go up if overall rates decline, but go down if rates increase. 
So we're a little short on time. So let me just kind of break it out like this. A, okay. a, a CD is a certificate of deposit. And I think sometimes people get CDs and bonds confused. So if interest rates of bonds increase, your bond price is going to decrease. And if interest rates go down, bond prices increase. And it's just because of supply and demand. But if you hold that bond to maturity, it doesn't matter. It's just only if you're going to liquidate that bond prior to maturity is when you're going to either sell it or buy it at a premium or a discount. Because <clears throat> in how it works is this, if interest rates go up, you have, I have a bond, Alan, a bond is a loan. And so let's say that bond is paying 5%. And so I'm lending my money to someone or organization and I'm getting $5,000. And let's say I want to liquidate this bond, but if interest rates go up, right? So that person has the ability to buy my bond to get a 5% coupon or 5% of interest or income, or let's say the market is paying 7%. They don't really want my bond because they can just go to another issuer and get 7% versus five. Yeah. So for me to entice that buyer that, hey, my bond is worth it, what do I I have to discount my price for that person to purchase the bond? Because they could buy a bond at 7%. Why would they pay for yours at 5% unless you gave them a discount? I, I have to discount. I have to entice them to buy it, so I have to discount. Sure. So that's bonds. And so if I hold the bond to maturity, I'm going to sell it back or I'm going to get my money back because it's just a loan. A CD works differently. You're going to get a guaranteed rate by the bank. It's a certificate of deposit. So I'm depositing my money at a bank that's FDIC insured and saying, hey, here's $100,000. I'm going to receive 5%. It doesn't matter what happens to interest rates. I'm going to get that guaranteed 5%. If I liquidate the CD prior to the maturity date of the CD, they probably will take any interest that was accrued in that CD back. So they work a little bit differently than bonds, but I think they're in the same category as a safe asset, depending on what types of bonds that you use in your overall portfolio. Yeah. So, so with the CD, yeah, there's a surrender penalty if you surrender early and typically it's based upon your interest that you received or part of the interest that you received, but you get all your principal back. It's different than a bond. All right. Got Jane. She, she calls in, writes in. Hi, Andy, Joe now. I love your podcast in all of your personalities. Wow. <laughs> thank well, thanks, thank Jane. You. You're the only podcast I don't put on double speed to listen to. Unbelievable. Only one. (laughs) Is it because we talk so fast anyway? No, because (laughs) she would not be able to understand me reading these questions because I fumble, (laughs) fart around them. I actually slow it down to 0.75 when Joe spins out the numbers. I should get more prepared (laughs) and read these things before we go on there. All right. Here's the question. What are your thoughts? Uh, where to park cash right now? What are the pros and cons of treasuries versus CDs as for taxes? Well, treasuries, state tax free. Correct. CDs, uh, 100% ordinary income tax. Yeah, federal and state. My Fidelity friend slash advisor recommended a three year annuity through Fidelity. So it's Fidelity friend. Got it. That's I wish like... I had a Fidelity friend. Yeah, me too. Here you go. He's a three-year annuity jobber. <laughs> Jam me into that. Uh, he said it was different than other annuities. You would go into a bank and purchase that have lots of fees. Okay. Oh, this is a special fidelity. Yeah, the annuity. special, the, right? Oh, the fidelity friend. <laughs> Got it. I could also just leave money in money market, but figure taxes and fees are high with all that. All the money decisions I make seem to be a little too late or just off slightly. Joe said the last time I wrote in, I show that I showed up to the party, but everyone else was drunk. <laughs> do you remember saying that? I do not. I don't remember hearing it, but yeah, that's a good line. It is. <laughs> yeah. Jane, I do vaguely remember that. Jane comes to the party. Yeah. yeah. But we're he's we're, sober and everyone we're, else. We're is, already gone. Yeah. And the alcohol's gone. <laughs> yeah. There's like a half a bottle of cream to mint. <laughs> No one wants to touch. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what we got left, Jane. <laughs> you want that on the rocks, you're straight up. By the way, the amount of extra cash is 400000 It won't be needed for at least five years. My drink of choice has changed from a pomegranate. Uh, help me, a pomeg- pomegranate. Pom- pomegranate. Pomegranate. I knew I could get it. Pomegranate yeah. pear vodka to a pineapple soda with Tito's. My husband still loves his red wine. 
Thank you. Thank you for all the great information you provide each week. Best podcast ever. Boom. Boom. <laughs> wow. Hashtag. Thanks, Jane. Okay. So Jane's got a little fidelity friend, wants to put a little three-year annuity in it. Yep. How old is Jane? Do we know how old Jane is? We uh, don't have that information, I don't doesn't think. Doesn't say. Okay. Doesn't need the money for five years. So it's a fixed annuity that the fidelity friend is recommending. The difference between that product and a CD is that the interest is going to grow tax deferred and you're not going to pay any of the income until you pull the money out, which is in three years. You might get a little bit higher rate, but if she's under 59 and a half, it's not going to make any sense. You got to be over 59 and a half to get the deferrals out without a 10% penalty. That's right. I don't know. Do I like that? Do I like a treasury? Yeah. Would you do treasury or CD? I would not do a CD. I would not do an annuity. I would probably do treasuries. But if I need the money in five years, I would probably do like part of it would probably be in a tax free money market account. And the rest would be in like in a tax free muni bond fund. Oh, really? Short term. Okay. Something like that. Interesting. I think I would do, I like treasuries from the tax standpoint, and then you can lock in a, a better rate. Yeah. But then you got to constantly look and buy and, you know, well, I, when I, they come due. Yes. That's the downside. And you can lose money on them if you have to sell them early. And I like CDs because they're easy and the rates are great, but you're only probably going to get a good rate for a year, maybe two. You know, you're not getting higher rates for five years. When's the first time you bought a CD, Al? First time? Yeah. Uh, See, now that do you, you remember when you first bought your well, first CD? I, I don't like, recall. I'm in my 40s, and I've, I've never purchased a CD. Well, I have several right now. I know, because you're in your 60s now. <laughs> Is that the turning point? No, you it, think it, now that you're getting a little bit older, you're like, man, I really like these CDs. And you're shopping CD rates versus before you probably never did. Well, I finally have a little cat. Oh, big house. Got, got that big wallet. Got the big wallet. And I'm, I am in my 60s. And uh, yes, I like that higher interest rate. I like having the knowledge that I can pull it out at any time. But we don't know how old Jane is. But I might, without knowing any more, I might say, some in treasuries, maybe a five-year treasury, and maybe some in CDs that you'd have quicker access to the funds if you need some of it. Five years. You still stay very safe cash type investment. Yeah. I mean, that's right on the border, right? Yeah. And markets at all-time highs. So just you got to consider that. Are they at all-time highs? Just about. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Yeah. Everyone's not drunk at the party this time. No. I think cash. Uh, Plenty of time. Yeah. And the yeah. alcohol is still there. It's still flowing. Got an email that starts with Andy. Please sub out our names. So good I did. What, was that? And then it says, good day, Andy. Yes. So that was just a note to me and then starting the email. So I've so, given these emailers the names Roger and Jessica, and you'll see why in just a second. Okay. okay. Roger and Jessica. From where? Texas. Fort Worth. Cowtown, they say. Oh, Cowtown. All right. Okay. All right. Good day, Andy, Joe, Big Al. Absolutely love the podcast. Great information and entertaining, which is hard to pull off. Although most of your spitballs deal with fat wallet people. A big fat wallet. I don't think we're fat wallets, but we're not in a bad situation either. <laughs> kind of normal people, so hopefully this will help some others. Start with the good stuff. We live in Cowtown, Texas. We drive a Red 2020 Ford F1, oh, Ford F350. It's big, oh, that's, that's a big, big red truck. Oh, yeah. It's a dually. Well, yeah, diesel probably, huh? Dually, we use it to pull a 35 foot 2022 travel trailer. Perfect. All right. Well, that ain't cheap. No, <laughs> you got a big wallet. <laughs> Jessica, my hot red, red headed wife. Picture Jessica Rabbit. Ah, has a very ugly go. box chihuahua. Picture old school Taco Bell mascot. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. You got the picture, Joe? I got the picture. Yeah, we got that. All right. We both enjoy a nice Coors Light on the weekends. We are team long haul truck drivers. We drive for a great company, which has led us to one of my questions. Here's some numbers. 401k, 370. Jessica's 325. We each make $110,000, 220 together. And we each contribute 8% with a 3% match. We have a 401, we both have 401k loans out, and that goes back into the account at a 3% rate. We are 60 and 59, and both accounts are in full equities with about 30% of each in company stock. We don't have any good bond 
funds available in the 401k uh, t- uh, selections to make in all the target date funds are high expenses. Uh, the company stock has done extremely well. That's how it's grown to what it represents now. When I first started the 401k, it was $20 a share. Now it sits at around $400 a share. Wow. Um, our spending is around 10500 a month. House will be paid off in seven years, truck in five years. That will lower our monthly output by 3000 We want to retire when my wife turns 65 in about six years. We don't plan on selling the house. Social Security for us is about $5,500 a month, and I have a pension from an old job that will give about $900 a month. Would like to spend about the same as we do now in retirement. All right. First pitfall, what do you think? What do I think? What do you think? (laughs) I think there's a lot of numbers here. I got to. <laughs> here, I'll tell you what I think. He's got 370, 325. So you got four, five, six, seven. Call, call he's it got seven. some. Um, he's still going to work for six years. To so call years. it, he's going to probably I, have a million bucks by the time he retires. Yeah, I computed 1.3. So I, here's how I got it seven, starting with 700,000. Adding twenty four thousand a year. That's eight percent plus the match. Yeah, well, that's with the match. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Yep. That's eight plus three. I actually did seven years, and the reason I did seven years is because that's their full retirement age for Social Security, which I was I kind of used that figure. So it's about one point three million, right? So uh, Social Security is about sixty six thousand spending. I I said ten thousand five hundred a month, but I'm going to reduce it by three thousand because seven years. The house is paid off. Yep. So that's about ninety thousand. So they need ninety. I didn't worry about inflation at this point. Straight numbers, ninety. Social Security sixty six. So you need thirty thousand from the portfolio. They're yeah. going to have a million it's a, three. That's it's a two and a half percent burn rate. It's a little over three, but yeah, which is probably fine. And that's how's it over three? If it's one point three and they need thirty thousand. Well, I'm saying they need one ten. Oh, okay. Because I did the I did inflation, so I, I kind of did I didn't inflate some stuff, but I, tr- I try to make this as conservative as possible. All right, but spending one ten, you got sixty six coming in, right? So you're about uh, forty grand short, right? Into one point three is about three point four percent. Okay, so I like that. I think if you can re- at sixty five, if you're a four percent distribution rate, I think this is a has a high probability of success. So I think that sounds good. So that's number one. What do you think? I think this works. Well, I think here's what I I think they're on track to have enough assets accumulated at the time they want to retire in seven years. They want to retire in six years, so it's going to be close. Yeah. I think where the real issue comes into play is that they're going to have to create a lot of income from the overall portfolio. And if a lot of this money's in their company stock that has split a couple of times, that is a 10 banger, uh, you got to be careful there. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because you want to make sure that you have the appropriate portfolio to give you the income that you need from a tax advantage, from a safety you know, perspective and everything else. So I think from a spitball back of the envelope, if they continue doing what they're doing, if they get a 6% rate of return over the next seven years, I think they're going to be close. Yeah, I think I actually think they're going to be fine. But second spitball is going to sort of go into what you were just kind of alluding to. So it goes, what to do with company stock and how does NUA work? Well, NUA is net unrealized appreciation. And so there's an IRS law that, allows you to take company stock out of your 401k plan and put it into a brokerage account. Why would you want to do that? Is because anything that comes out of a 401k IRA type of account is taxed at ordinary income rates. So you bought the stock for a dollar, it's worth $10 and you have a thousand shares. So you have a hundred thousand dollars or whatever that math is. Right. Everything comes out as ordinary income. You have to pay the highest tax rates. Net unrealized appreciation is that, let's say you bought it for a dollar a share, it's worth $10 a share, you move those shares out, you only pay ordinary income tax on the basis, which is a dollar a share. 
So all of that appreciation, which is NUA net unrealized appreciation, then is going to be tax at capital gains rate, which is a lot lower in most cases than ordinary income. So it's a tax play. It allows you to take the stock onto the 401k plan, put it into a brokerage account, then sell it at long-term capital gains. It also gives people the tax diversification that they probably need. Because if all of your money sitting in a 401k plan, everything is going to be taxed at ordinary income rates. This allows some capital gains tax to be included in your overall distribution strategy. Yeah, and it's especially important when you think about Social Security, taxed as ordinary income, most of it, and pension. In this case, $900 per month, that's taxed as ordinary income. So if you get this stock out of the 401k, then you pay ordinary income tax on that cost basis. And then the capital gain tax on all the gain, you only pay that when you sell the shares. Anyway, so you could do that all at once. You could sell the shares. You could do it slowly over time. But going back to your point, Joe, is you're going to have to produce a bunch of income from this portfolio. So if this is stock that's non-dividend, non-dividend stock, it's not necessarily going to work in terms of creating a cash flow, but then there's other assets too. So it, it just depends. This is where the planning sort of comes in play. And, and that is how to create an income stream tax efficiently with the assets that you have. And in this case, there is a shortfall of, of over $40,000 that needs to come from the portfolio one way or another. So is third spitballs, how do I de-risk into bonds? Well, that's tough. It's you're six years out, right? So you don't want to de-risk the year before. So you slowly want to de-risk now, right? Because you don't necessarily know what the market's going to do over the next several years. So it's, all right, I have a 100% stock portfolio now, but you need to work towards a glide path, if you will, to, over the next six years to get enough safety in the portfolio. So the year you're retired, if the market tanks 20%, you don't have 100% stocks, right? So you slowly have to do this over time and depending on the strategy. Some people do it with, you know, contributions you, or when you rebalance, you're just going to start adding a little bit more towards safety asset classes as you get closer to that retirement date. That fourth spitfall is we each open a Roth account with a couple hundred bucks to start the five-year clock. Not sure about doing some big barn backdoor Roth conversions. What estimates do you think on our tax bracket for us in retirement? Company plug. Thanks to Andy for telling about it. Company plug. Keep reading. Oh, <laughs> we have used your guys' easy calculator and it's great. Best part of the show, spitballs. You guys give in the derails. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you. I don't know. I have no idea what to, I mean, so he's got to do NUA when he retires. So he's going to have a little bit of tax to get that money into a, but with the, doesn't have a large, he's probably 12%. There's going to be room in the 12 or 15% tax bracket to do conversions for sure. I think so too, Joe, because I mean, if you just take social security and the little pension that they have, it's probably going to keep them in the, what is now the 12% bracket soon to become 15% bracket. And so that's probably your best bet is to convert up to that. But then since you're in that bracket, you got to be careful with capital gains and NUA. So it's a little tricky, right? So you kind of, you're going to have to do some tax projections to get this just right. All right. Thank you for the question there, Jessica and Roger. It's clever, Andy. It, it is. Very clever. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are aspects of your retirement planning that you cannot control. But are you controlling the controllable, like your taxes in retirement? Our collective individual income tax is estimated to add up to $2.3 trillion this year. How much of that will you be paying? If you're expecting a hefty 2023 tax bill, you can do something about it, but the clock is ticking. Watch YMYWTV to learn from Joe and Big Al 10 tax cutting moves to make now before the end of the year so you can send less of your money to the IRS. And don't forget to download the companion guide as well. But it's a limited time offer, so get it before this Friday. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to watch the show and download the free guide. One of those moves to consider is a donor advised fund. Let's learn more. This is M.E. from Atlanta. My drink of choice is a Texas margarita on the rocks with salt or a Lining Google summer shanty beer. Ooh, a Lining Google. That's brewed in uh, Scotty. 
my husband and I have a feisty golden retriever. I have a question about contributing to a donor advice fund and making a Roth conversion in the same year. My husband and I are consistently donating twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a year in charities. We have a ve- we have very little money in Roth. Most of our two million dollars in retirement assets are in pre tax money. I'll be receiving an inheritance of a hundred thousand this year, and I'm thinking about contributing it to a donor advice fund. We have other cash, two hundred thousand dollars. While at the same time converting a hundred thousand dollars of pre-tax money to Roth, would these two events zero out the tax consequence? We are three years out from retirement. We will continue to contribute to our four hundred one ks and brokerage, and we will draw down pre-tax money to live off of three years before collecting Social Security. Thanks, Me. All right, so donor advice fund. Let's explain that. Yeah, we'll start there. So yeah, donor advised fund is an account that you set up. You're the trustee. It's for future charity, right? So you put money into a donor advised fund, you get a tax deduction for the amount that you put in, the year that you put it in. And then over time, you get to decide which charities get which amounts. And there's no minimum or maximums. You can let it ride for a while. You can start giving money out right away distribute it one year, two years, three years, five years, whatever it may be. But it's a way to take future year contributions and deduct them all in one year. Perhaps when you have a high income year, or in this case, when you want to have the deduction to offset a Roth conversion, which adds income. Dollar for dollar? Sort of. Here's the only limitation. Uh, When you do a contribution, donor advice fund, or any contribution for that matter, you're limited to 60% of your income. So depending upon what the income is, maybe so. Maybe it's dollar for dollar, maybe not. So she's going to put $100,000 in this donor advice fund. She'll get a charitable deduction on the tax return of 100000 So then I'm going to convert $100,000 from my retirement account to a Roth IRA. So let's just assume a $100,000 conversion in a hypothetical tax bracket, yeah. state and federal, called 30%. So she's going to owe $30,000 in taxes. But she's in that 30% tax bracket, so she's going to give $100,000 to a charity, but it's not going to go directly to the charity. She's going to set up her own type of foundation, if you will, but it's called a donor advised fund. It's really cheap to administer. But then that $100,000 is a tax deduction. She's in the 30% tax bracket. Wouldn't she receive $30,000 of potential tax savings? Sure, if she had $100,000 of income already. Right. So the hundred plus the hundred Roth conversion, two hundred thousand, sixty percent of that's one twenty. She wants to deduct a hundred, no problem. Let's say she's got no income, right? And she just does a hundred thousand dollar Roth conversion. And then sixty percent of that hundred thousand is sixty grand. She couldn't deduct the whole hundred. And she wouldn't want to because she'd be in a low bracket. But that's the math. But I'll tell I'll give you a better idea, M E from Atlanta. If you have Appreciated stock outside of retirement funds, donate that to a donor advised fund because you don't have to pay capital gains tax on that. But be aware you only get 30% of your adjusted gross income. So maybe you do, you know, the first 30% capital gains so you don't have to pay tax on that money and then do the other, you know, 30% from cash. And then you'll be in a better spot. You, You save some of that cash, right? And there's no tax to pay on that. Yeah, I guess a a, a different way to say that is if you're going to fund a donor advised fund is that you want to look at what is the best way to fund it. Cash is still fine, but that's the last thing you want to resort to. If you have highly appreciated assets that you will sell eventually down the road, well, just donate those because then the donor advised fund sells those assets and there's no tax to pay. We see a mistake that Emmy is going to have, wants to donate 100000 hypothetically, that she did not receive this inheritance. So let's say uh, $10,000 basis, $100,000 account, they sell it, and then they're going to give the cash away. Well, that's $90,000 of gains, hypothetically, in this example, where Emmy would have to pay tax on the gain to give the cash. Well, they'll always give the appreciated stock. So if you want to put it in a donor advice fund, you can do that. If you want to give it to a qualifying charity, you can do that. So just understand it's the gifting season. So if you're going to give, just know the tax rules 
as you give assets to organizations. Yeah, and if you put too much into the, your donor advice fund, that excess contribution that you can't deduct currently no, carries no. over. Carries over for another five years. All right, show's cut your money well. Spitball your own situation in minutes with our free retirement calculator at easyretirement.com. That's E A S I retirement.com. Joe's new puppy, Gettysburg, the effects of rum, how to start your emails, Curious George, M E, and who the three of us are named after, and Lining Kugel in the derails at the end of the episode, so stick around. Help new listeners find YMYW by telling your friends about the show and by leaving your honest reviews and ratings for Your Money, Your Wealth in Apple Podcasts and any other podcast app that accepts them. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment in person at one of our many offices around the country or online at a date and time convenient for you no matter where you are. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals at Pure will be able to identify strategies that will help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Man, my eyes are going. <laughs> you're on my reading glasses. I don't know what's going on today. I just cannot read. Or it's because it's you're tired. You could be. Made the huge mistake of purchasing a puppy for the kids for the holidays. <laughs> oh my gosh! That puppy with two young children. Yeah. And in-laws. Huh? That's I quite. Got, a, I got quite the a combo. in-laws for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we got the puppy that used to stay in the spare bedroom. Yep. Is now in the living room. Yep. And howling. Howling. Howling at the moon. <laughs> and then wakes up the little one. The little one runs into the room, scared of the howling at the moon. You get yeah. the little one back into bed. The, the puppy falls asleep. Then it's howling at then the cat. It's just a, it's utter disaster. Well. So I'm just like, just jacked up on Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And then I can't fall asleep because I'm jacked up on Celsius. And as soon as I fall asleep, the damn dog starts howling or the puppy. So, exactly. anyway. Okay. So, and that it, affects your eyesight, apparently. It, it does. It's a, a little blurred. Blur right. vision. Oh, Would bad. you like some help, Joe? No, I got this. I got oh, this. Oh, boy. Here we go. I wonder do, do they keep the, like, the battlefields clear? Or oh, do you yeah. think they build on them? I haven't been back there, so I don't know. But typically, they have museums and they have areas of land that are dedicated for the battles. And then they reenact. Well, they do that. Uh, I mean, I I know they do it for the Civil War. I'm not sure about the Revolutionary War. No. I, I think it is actually a place where you can go and visit. There is reference to the Gettysburg Battlefield being a national park. No, that's cool. There you go. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people um, perish there, but I, I, I'm a big U.S. history buff. Yes. Then no. why didn't you know that, Joe? <laughs> well, I didn't I know that it, because, you could go to the... Because he didn't have Google in front of him, <laughs> as you did. Well, no, I mean, I enjoy, you know, reading or watching those types of movies or whatever. I don't... I'm not going to go to the battlefield and reenact the whole war. <laughs> Maybe you should. It might, bit, yeah. might be good for you. Maybe I should, yeah. If there is a museum and visitor center. They do lecture series, yeah. You get right. really into it. There we go. It's the next little family vacation. I think so. <laughs> we just figured it out. Dark rum, light rum. Yeah. Light. Party. Yeah. May Myers. I like dark. Oh, all right. I haven't had rum since college. You, you, you haven't gone to the islands as much as I have. It's my taste. Oh, oh, maybe I have. I've had a mic time when I was in. Uh, was little, He's had rum, but he forgets. Right. That yeah, was, that was like ten yes, years ago. Exactly, and I just got yeah, I got a little buzzed, and I was like, oh boy. Is that what's supposed to happen? I mean, they come and sneak up on you. You know, if you, if you ever get a mai tai at Bally High in San Diego, oh my god, that, forget about it. It's like a Long Island iced tea. There's it's there's no juice in it. It's 100 percent alcohol. Yeah, 100. percent No, that's yeah. not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I like to control when I know that the buzz is gonna creep. Got it. Yeah. Versus like just just all, blind, all, at once. all of a sudden it blindsides you. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm not okay. I hear you. He's a professional at this. <laughs> That's right. Good day. 
Andy Joe. Uh, I mean, if okay, so first of all, <laughs> let me sub the names, but you start your email with good day. Good day. That's uh, that's true. So if you're trying to like <laughs> You're trying to be under the radar here because maybe they got friends or family that listen to it that yes. are from Cowtown, USA. And then you're saying, hey, don't tell anyone my name, but I'm going to start an email by good. No one ever starts an email with good day, except for this guy. <laughs> he just gave himself away. I am getting better. Curious George. I want to thanks for that uh, little shout out from our listener that told me to get some Curious George books. So I'm right. right to the store. I'm, yeah, and then I got a little curious your little doll. It brought me back to, you did. to my childhood. Did put a smile on your face? I did. Yeah. I did. So yeah. now the man in the yellow hat and uh, curious George, I got all the adventures. I think I need one of those. All right. I'll, well, here we go. It's <laughs> Christmas holiday present. Season. <laughs> M period E period. Yeah. Yep. Never. I. Anyone? Nope. Anyone? I would say Michael Edward. Or maybe it's just, I want to go with me, so I'm going to pretend my initials are M-E. <laughs> okay. I, what do you got? My initials are Joseph Dennis, J-D. J-D. So you hear people go, hey, J-D. Hey, J-D, yeah. My initials are A-L-L, all. All. All, <laughs> all in. <laughs> and my right. initials are art. But, well, yeah, A-R. You know, I don't think A-R. I know what A- It's Richard, right? Alan uh, Richard? Robert. Yeah, of course, Dad. Yeah, Bob. just like your dentist after your dad. That's right. Yeah, that's why we're a power duo here. <laughs> now we're a power we got, trio. We got our dad's middle name. Yeah, you have your dad's middle name, and is that Al? No, uh, that's her My middle name is actually my grandmother's middle name. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, female side, they don't go with the like their mom's name. Yeah, uh, they go. It's usually like the middle name of something. Yeah. Okay. I digress again, man. I'm tired. <laughs> We're going to get through this, bud. <laughs> but I will tell you. So my dad is Robert William, and then I became Alan Robert, oh. and my first son is Robert oh. Allen. <laughs> Very Wait, original. Keep it confusing. <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense. <laughs> this is, okay, M-E. We're going back to M-E from Atlanta. Hot okay. Atlanta. Right there. I lived in Hot Atlanta for a hot minute, right? The Darlington. Were you there in the summer? Yep, across okay. the street from the Piedmont Hospital. So a little shout out. Got it. Or a Lining Google Summer Shanty Beer. Oh, a little Lining Google. That's brewed in uh, Piscani. Wow. Oh, you actually know that one. Okay. Oh, yeah. I've had a fair share of Lining Google. Really? Yep. I didn't. I wouldn't have known how to pronounce it. Yeah, yes. me either. I was waiting for that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good. <laughs> when it comes to drinks. Yeah. Come on. You throw got, that, throw you got all there. Yeah. Well, got actually, it. when it's brewed right across the street from yeah. the, the, the homeland. No okay. cats. Got it. <laughs> 